I'm Nancy McCocken, and welcome to Living Karma Yoga, which is a celebration of all the yoga world has to offer, from asana, which is posture, and that's what you do in the yoga classes, typically. Sometimes you'll find meditation there, but you can do asana and meditation at home, to pranayama, to mudras, which are hand positions that channel energy in very specific ways, and there's mudras for headaches, and mudras for anxiety, mudras for joy, um, to lifestyle, Ayurveda, nutrition, um, and travel, and so very, very much more to help you take your yoga off the mat, which is really where it belongs. Learning how to be more equanimous and more joyful, we practice on the mat so that we can have those qualities in our lives. Today, um, my guest, I have a really special treat. So today, my guest is Monique Herzig, and she's the founder and artist um, at Alchemy, the Art of Slow Living. Uh, Monique will demonstrate her art um, on me, which is um, henna. So, and I have, was reading the wrong bio, so I'm gonna do it over again. So she believes, and her program is, or her business is Alchemy, the Art of Slow Living. It's located in Ferndale, Michigan. Monique began to refine her vision for slow living while still in college in the 90s. As a recreation and leisure studies major, she explored the curious irony that the more humans rely on time savers, the more hours a week we work. Instead of using the found time for leisure, we speed up our lives by multitasking and working harder. All this extra work is causing disconnection, dissatisfaction, and disease. Fortunately, she says there's an antidote. Slow down, seek rich experiences, nourish relationships. Monique's business, Slow Living, emphasizes a slower approach to everyday life, mindfulness, the savoring of experiences, creating rich relationships with our community, environment, self, food, and friends. So Monique is going to be dis um, talking about and um, demonstrating the art of henna. Thank you for coming. Oh my gosh, thank you for inviting me. I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted good, to be good, here. Good, good, I'm glad. And I might cry. I cry when everything's, anything's really moving for me. Tears are just a way of telling us we need to be paying attention anyway. Right, right. you're right, yep. So Monique, can you explain to our audience what henna is and how does it fit into your philosophy of slow living? Okay, well, henna is a plant. You can go there. Uh, henna is a plant and it grows in large swaths of the world, everywhere from Northwest Africa to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And everywhere that the plant grows, you have traditions of adorning the body or anointing the body or wearing the henna in mm -hmm. your hair. So henna is a plant that has a molecule in it that stains the skin. Okay. And we can manipulate the beauty of that design by using uh, tools. Okay. And the tool that I use is a, a rolled piece of cellophane that I've put the prepared paste in. Mm -hmm. In some parts of the world, like in Morocco, it's more typical to see something that is a syringe, mm -hmm. uh, and the henna is sucked up into here, and the henna is applied like okay. this. And but the needed needle doesn't prick the skin. The henna, henna, the henna paste is the only thing that penetrates the skin, okay. whether you're using a cellophane cone mm -hmm. or the syringe, or uh, in some parts of the world they use little bits of medical tape, okay. and then a resist process. Okay. So little bits of medical tape are applied to the skin, and then the henna would be smeared over the top, mm -hmm. and then when you peel away the medical tape, there's a design, there's a design left okay. behind. Okay. Beautiful, yeah. thank you. Sure. And Monique is going to demonstrate the art of henna today too, and we're going to have a conversation while she does it. Uh, yeah, we actually often get very distracted in the studio, and the applying actually takes longer than it needs to because, <laughs> because of the conversation. Because of the conversation, yeah. which right. leads back to your question about how the henna fits in to the philosophy of slow living. Mm -hmm. And um, the moment of applying the henna requires you to slow down and to be still. And so that's one part of it, is just the slowing down. The mm -hmm. other part is that there's often um, a safe intimacy in applying the henna because we're sitting close, there's a lot of contact, and um, human connection is a right. really important component right. of that slow living. Um, so those are two ways. And the other way is that 
Um, to my mind, anything that requires a lot of attention and detail mm -hmm. to bring the product to you. For example, I heard recently that uh, for a really beautiful cup of coffee, as many as 80 people might have handled wow. those beans in that cup. Right. Or with a really beautiful cocktail or a well-prepared meal where a lot of intention and time and care goes into the preparation for something that's really all about the sensory experience. Right and it's really fleeting, mm -hmm. fits into that, that model of slow living. Okay, beautiful, thanks. My hand gets a little shaky. Is it possible for you to talk about what you're doing while you're doing it? I can try. So I am applying a gentle pressure to the cone that's in my hand in order to release small bits of the henna paste to paint it onto the skin. And my, my goal in this design is to apply lovely little straight lines in a layout that to me feels a little bit like jewelry mm -hmm. because when your hand ha hangs down that's where a bangle might lay right. and that's a, it's just a really beautiful expression on the skin mm -hmm. when the paste is taken off and mm -hmm. the stain is left behind. Okay. What kind of a plant is the henna plant? Is it a shrub? It is a shrub and it's a really kind of a humble little plant. I've heard it called privet, minuet, okay. It's not, it's not super pretty or luscious, and the plant itself is called Lawsonia mm -hmm. inermis. Okay. And the Lawsonia borrows the name from the molecule that we're using to stain mm -hmm. your skin, and inermis just means thornless. Okay. So you can actually have a rosa inermis, which means a thornless rose. Okay, so cool. But it doesn't really share anything botanically other than the fact that it doesn't have thorns, thorns. on it. Okay, thank you. If we lived in a place where the henna plant grew, we could take the leaves directly off the shrub and mm -hmm. grind them up and stain the body. Okay. But because we don't live someplace warm where mm -hmm. henna grows, we have to get the henna prepared mm -hmm. and delivered. Mm -hmm. um, so my henna comes in this dried form mm -hmm. that looks a little bit like matcha. Do you want to smell does. it? It does. Oh, I love the smell. What does it make it's you think of? It's kind of fruity. I'm not sure what it makes. It smells of hay mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, I think so too, hay or mown grass. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a sensual, it makes my mouth water too. Mm. Yeah, to me, to me it makes me think of matcha, the, the, tea, the tea smell of matcha or um, and it's about the texture of baking flour. Okay. And then, bef and then I add water and essential oils to mm -hmm. it in order to make the paste. Okay. And what oil did you add to this? Because it smells one, really nice. Yeah, this one has kajaput, which I think is in the Melaleuca family. Mm -hmm. So people would recognize the fragrance profile with um, shares components like tea tree okay. and. Uh, eucalyptus, mm -hmm. but it's generally tolerated on the skin. Did you have to experiment to find out what oils were tolerated? Actually, I was really fortunate to become part of a group of people who were really willing to teach. Okay. That are very passionate about using the natural henna mm -hmm. on the body, and there are certain essential oils that we know work just mm -hmm. from time and exper right. experimentation, and they tend to be high in that um, really bright, green, cheerful, uplifting okay. fragrance profile, right. um, like the tea tree uh -huh. or the Right. The eucalyptus. And then, so this one has kajput and uh, rose geranium. Hmm. Partly because I love the rosy fragrance of the, the geranium, mm -hmm. but also because it will help the skin stain. And is this primarily something that women do? Yeah, actually, men do 
receive henna around the globe, but it tends to be less decorative. Okay. So um, I hear stories of men at weddings having just a finger dipped, mm -hmm. uh, pinky or the ring finger, mm -hmm. uh, or men having um, like a, a thick blob of the paste right. in, this, in the hand and then the hand just gets closed over it. And okay. so you just let the henna do what it does. There's no, you don't give it a direction by right. applying it a certain mm -hmm. way. And then a friend of mine who's married to a Persian man mm -hmm. said that in the village that his father lives in still, they hollow out um, a hole into the earth and mix a whole big batch of it because henna can be used to treat certain things medicinally as, oh, a, as an okay. herbal treatment. Beautiful. Yeah, and so they, their yeah. feet are stained with the color of the henna, but it's really designed to treat things like ringworm. Okay. Foot fungus. Right. But yeah, anyway, so it's used still medicinally. Uh -huh. um, so as far as men getting it, it does tend to be globally less decorative mm -hmm. and more situational or ceremonial, mm -hmm. whereas women will get henna just like they get their nails done. Okay. Yeah. Just for fun because for it's fun. pretty. Because it's beautiful. Yes. yes. And there are um, there are traditions too, and I'm thinking of primarily India, mm -hmm. where um, henna is part of the wedding ceremony, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or the, the traditional wedding garb? Yes. Well, my understanding is that there's actually like 16 different marks of beauty, including the woman's henna. And again, that is sometimes decorative and sometimes less, although henna has been gaining in popularity globally okay. for like 50 years. Okay. There's this lovely arc, thank goodness, that lots of people are discovering mm -hmm. um, the beauty of the, the and the power of the plant. Right. Um, beyond traditional use, mm -hmm. um, but yes, weddings, um, birth, circumcision in some places in the world. Mm. Um, so it tends to be used for times of celebration. Okay. And my understanding is that it is done sometimes at religious ceremonies, mm -hmm. but not for religious reasons. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. It is. Yep. It's more for part of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And, and as you said, celebration. Celebration. Mm -hmm. So the design, it looks like there's a spiral in the center, mm -hmm. uh, which reminds me of an eye. Mm -hmm. So what is the, what do you see in here and why this design? Um, the simple answer is because I was pretty confident that I could do it in this setting. Okay. Also that I, I do really love the way it it looks like jewelry, right? but there is a bit of a language, and if you look at lots of henna art, you'll see similar motifs repeat, mm -hmm. like a straight line, two straight lines stacked with bumps along the line, okay. right? Or the spiral is a really typical way of starting a design mm -hmm. or being the center of a flower. Mm -hmm. um, flowers figure pretty heavily mm -hmm. in the design work. Um, with technology and globalization and the fact that you could be on a street in Marrakesh and pull up someone's Instagram from yep. from New York and then copy that right. artist's work, you mm -hmm. see uh, the design motifs are a lot more fluid mm -hmm. than maybe they were in the past. But historians of henna can identify regional differences okay. based on the motifs that you tend right. to see. Kind of like on pottery. A lot like pottery, and okay. that's specifically important because henna tends to be a woman's art, right? As well as pottery would mm -hmm. be, or home goods that are used in mm -hmm. the home. So you mm -hmm. do see in carpentry that or um, rugs that women might make, right. or in pottery, or in henna as a decorative art, um, motifs that that cross those right um, mediums. Mm -hmm. Good. And I know that um, when I, when you did my henna um, at a party, so mm -hmm. a celebratory party, you were talking about the paisley, mm -hmm. um, and so that was such such a fascination because one of the things that you mentioned is that the original shape of the mm -hmm. paisley represented mango, mm -hmm. the mango. So I'm I'm assuming that the various shapes and the lines are also representing various. Um, things that are culturally significant, I think depending you on what. I, and you see that, I think, especially if you're talking about Hindi art versus um, Muslim art. Okay. Because in Hindi art, you would also see, um, in both you might see the mango. Right. 
but you wouldn't see um, swans and peacocks and other or or human figures right. in in the Arabic art, mm -hmm. where you would see those motifs in Hindi okay. art. You often will see. Um, imagery of celebration to like instruments that are right. played at weddings right. which is super interesting mm -hmm. yeah my favorite thing about the story of that mango is that the mango is literally the most consumed vegetable or fruit, fruit. the world right. over right so it's super nourishing mm -hmm. for a lot of people and the way that I heard it told is that the mango was used on the Indian subcontinent in textile design okay and then the um, the, col the colonialists from Great Britain took those motifs back with them. Mm -hmm. It was altered in a very um, Jacobian way, like mm -hmm. super Franken flower, right? right? And you, mm -hmm. s you see it a lot in textile design, right? Mm -hmm. the, the motifs that a lot of us associate with henna art come from those Jacobian motifs that then go back yeah. and become part of the tapestry motifs that you wow. see in mm -hmm. the Indian subcontinent right. again. So there's a lot of borrowing back and forth from this humble little, mm -hmm. this humble little fruit. That's very cool. We can put a paisley here. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that is it seems to represent the coil with infinity too. Yeah, it does. It so there's this, I don't know if you can see it at home, that there's the kind of eye and the curling mm -hmm. around, you know. Um, and what is it, the Ouroboros, I think, with uh, which is actually the figure eight, which is mm. not quite this, but it represents, it's the symbol of infinity, um, and it represents a snake with a tail in its mouth. Ooh. So it's going back and forth, and mm -hmm. that has been, I think, cross-culturally a symbol uh, that's been very important to people throughout the yeah, ages. Yeah, I love it. It has so a, almost there. It does have a little bit of that Nautilus feel, right. too, right? The, yeah. the elegance of that, right. that curve. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to comment on is that um, at the party that we were at, it was a henna party, but it was also a celebration, the graduation for our teacher trainees, um, Monique went from one person to the next and totally focused on each person that she was with, which to me seems to go right along with her understanding of how slow living cultivates relationships and creates rich relationships mm -hmm. because you're very present in your eyes and your heart and I can tell nothing else is there except our conversation and what you're doing. I really try that. Yeah. I think that um, my emotional connection with the henna is because of that. Right. Um, in the studio I try to create a really safe space mm -hmm. and when I come out to a friend's house to do henna I try right. to create that same kind of mm -hmm. safe space for mm -hmm. our interaction. Right. And other, it's, it's a little bit like performance Start, right because other people wanted to engage in the process too right. but we were still having our moment which I exactly. really appreciate yeah. yeah in the center of the rest of that little chaos. and it's rare I think to meet somebody just like that mm -hmm. and then connect in such a way that everybody's comfortable and a conversation flows the way mm -hmm. a conversation is flowing right now yeah, well, and that's well, that's probably why I love it so much, right? Because we're having this 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 connection right. and this conversation right. that goes maybe a little bit beyond what we might do on social media or just passing each other in the grocery store. But the next time we do come in contact with right. each other, we have this this building block, right? And it feels like a friendship, Ooh, it's a genuine I hope friendship. So. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know, but it isn't something that that is um, easy to come by. I think in our daily lives because we're so busy as you say. Well, that's the whole thing about the multitasking, right? Like, as I'm trying to talk and draw lines right. at the same time. But the, the thing about multitasking is that we, we may fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing both of those tasks well, uh -huh. but we're really only partially attending right. to both of them. Right. Yeah, trying to do work on the computer and watch the television and attend to the kids and, talk and to the art. yeah, <laughs> and I mean, make dinner. <laughs> yeah, well, I always burn something if I try. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think I'm annoying my neighbors because of so many times that I've burnt toast because I start it or start something on the stove and then get go to the computer and forget. I get distracted. Right. Yes. So well, that's easy to do. So I'd like you to tell the audience at home what happens now to this paste. 
Okay, so the paste is gonna dry, and sometimes hey, people, you ready? can, yeah, the camera may be able to pick it up. It's cracking a little bit, and I can touch where mm -hmm. I've, you know, where I've started those lines, or they were a little bit thinner. Uh, the paste will dry on the skin, and I'll first say um, that I've done the easy part, the harder part is that you actually, if you want a successful stain, need to attend and be mindful of the paste being on your skin right. and try to keep it from not flaking off too soon. Mm -hmm. But if you do all of that, then what will happen is that you will later flake the paste off into um, the sink or the garbage. I want to talk about that because in some places they actually reserve that. Okay. Um, so you're going to take the paste off and then your skin will be stained mm -hmm. and you might think that it's too orange and that it's disappointing mm -hmm. and it probably is at that point because you're thinking is it going to get darker. Right. Um, I've been doing it on myself for a long time and I have those thoughts every right. single time. <laughs> so um, the paste will eventually, um, that, that molecule that I mentioned, that mm -hmm. loss one molecule, has bonded, but it needs time to oxidize. Oh, okay. Sort of like when you leave an apple on the counter. Right, and, and it turns it, brown. Mm -hmm, that's okay. basically, the, yeah, it's yeah, it's a beautiful spoilage. Alrighty. Yes, and then cool. um, that, that bond with the keratin or the protein bond with the, the molecule from the plant mm -hmm. is actually permanent. Okay. But your skin is constantly renewing, and so the design fades away. Mm -hmm. And I've had people tell me lovely stories about getting henna before going on a trip, mm -hmm. right before, and then literally being able to watch time pass as the stain darkens, yeah. matures, and falls That's away. Right. Yeah, that over the beautiful. course of the 10 days or so. Yeah, I think mine took two weeks to mm -hmm. actually completely fade, mm -hmm. which was beautiful. And the first time I had it done, I was really bummed out that it wasn't as dark as the paste is. I thought, oh, oh. that's the color that I really want is that mm -hmm. really dark, deep brown. But it's okay because it makes my hand feel lovely, even, if it, even as it fades. Isn't I can still see it. Yeah, one of my favorite things somebody ever said to me as she was sitting in the studio looking at her henna was, I never really think about feeling pretty. Oh, yes. yes. I know. Yeah, <laughs> why not, right? What I, and whatever it is, right? right? Mm -hmm. or, or my feet are so ugly, can you henna them? And then the story goes, I got so many compliments on my feet that I don't hate them anymore. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. It's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. to do for somebody. How long does it typically take for the skin to react and to absorb the henna? It's absorbing now. Okay. And if it were really hot out, mm -hmm. then you would still get a lovely stain after a short period of time. But mm -hmm. we like to tell people six to eight hours in okay. the winter and four to six in the summer. Okay, good. Yeah, for, you know, of leaving the paste mm -hmm. on the skin. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I like about it is that it's not permanent mm -hmm. and I can get a new design in mm -hmm. the same place. Yeah, I like, I'm kind of a fickle person and I look <laughs> at so much art and I'm, and I'm inspired by the artists that I have artist crushes on uh -huh. and I always want to try new things. So I'm glad for the way that it disappears. Um, it's a little like a Buddhist sand painting. Well, and I think that's an important point, right? That not everything has to be permanent in order right. to have value. Right. Um, I mentioned about the uh, a beautiful cocktail or a lovely, lovingly prepared meal mm -hmm. that um, that those moments leave a lasting impression on us, those experiences, right? right? And so that has value, or a beautiful bouquet, that right. beauty itself has value, mm -hmm. that it, even though it's going to disappear. And the, the sand art is a good example of that. And I mentioned um, the sand art reminded me of the flaking away of the henna paste. Mm -hmm. And I've been told that in um, Morocco specifically, that the bride, after she has her henna done, will uh, use a special basin of water to remove the paste and then that water is then used to uh, water plants 
Oh, that's beautiful. So the, yes, the henna itself is believed to be infused with um, a certain amount of goodwill or mm -hmm. um, has value itself. Mm -hmm. um, and you asked about motifs that um, have meaning like the paisley or that spiral. Mm -hmm. And in Morocco, some of those motifs are named mm -hmm. like the peach tree or okay. the almond tree or okay. the little frog right. or the little turtle, which is an interesting little exception too to this idea of not putting uh, something with a spirit mm into the artwork mm -hmm. um, and I find that really captivating this idea of um, the folk artness of right. it surviving um, you know now into the to the modern world right and you you just mentioned something not putting this not putting a spirit of something into the henna what does that mean um, well in in Muslim art you don't see figures right, right. anything with an eye or a soul so you wouldn't see a oh, bird necessarily okay. or that frog okay. that I mentioned that shape is representative and doesn't actually look a lot like a frog it actually okay. looks like a, a diamond with okay. some legs okay on it but you, there's sort of a prohibition against capturing a spirit. Mm -hmm, exactly. Mm -hmm. A little bit like um, some native tribes don't want, or native peoples don't mm -hmm. want their picture taken yeah, because it feels yeah, like yeah, it yeah. captures the soul. Right. I through that. Yeah. So, but I actually kind of love those things where we have the modern world walking in step with really ancient traditions, mm -hmm. like that idea of collecting the little bits of henna and using them to kind of return to the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Starting to feel very sacred. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's, there's both, right? There can be both the, um, the daily, every, all the timeness of it. Oops, excuse me. Mm -hmm. We're done, sorry. <laughs> I didn't see the prompter. Anyway, thank see, you, that's Monique. what it is about being in the moment, right? Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank all of you at home for joining us today. Uh, for more information on our schedule at Karma Yoga, go to www.karmayoga.net. We very much look forward to seeing you in class. If you're interested in uh, Monique's art, do you have a website? I do, absolutely. It's Alchemy Hannah at alchemyhenna.com okay. and alchemyhenna on all social media. Okay, thank you very much for, um, for listening and thank you uh, Bloomfield Community Television for hosting us. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm